Hi all, um, my name is Carola Frediani. Uh, my talk is going to be uh, way less technical than the one before, sorry for this, uh, but I don't have a technical background. Uh, I have a journalistic background and I covered cybersecurity, surveillance, privacy. And today I'm going to talk about uh, backdoors in a wide meaning. Uh, so back, about backdoor dreams, backdoor paranoia, or backdoor nightmares, depending on the viewpoint. And I'm going to <coughs> analyze a couple of cases that I found interesting, and uh, the way they developed, uh, the way the rumors developed about these cases, if there was a backdoor, if there was no backdoor at all, and uh, if there is any lesson learned because we know that backdoors, you know, talks are uh, quite a hotly debated issue and uh, especially if we are talking about security products, right? So, <clears throat> so we start from a story from the 60s actually because uh, um, way before the online uh, uh, troll farms, we've been talking in the last year so the inauthentic coordinated behavior on social media, there were actually um, psyops and uh, black propaganda operations going on, even, you know, of course, in the Cold War era, and uh, they were made of pamphlets and radio broadcasts and so on. So, uh, this story actually came out a few weeks ago, so it's quite recent, even if it's talking about the 60s, and uh, it's about this operation by the UK Foreign Office and uh, its uh, propaganda arm that uh, was, uh, had been assigned to, to steer uh, Indone Indonesian anti-communists uh, to overthrow the Sukarno uh, regime that was a left-leaning anti-colonialist regime. So uh, they did it through black propaganda. So through <clears throat> actually they had the British, uh, uh, the British that published this pamphlet that seemed to come from Indonesian emigre, and they were also circulating and spreading lies, and um, they did it also uh, through backdoor cipher machines. It, so intercepting and uh, decoding the communications of uh, uh, the government. So basically the GCHQ, which is the British equivalent of the NSA, could uh, break and uh, read the Indonesian encrypted messages without problems. So there is also a memorandum uh, that is highlighting the contribution made through uh, SIGINT, Signal Intelligence. So the materials they were able to uh, collect and decode uh, would help the army, the generals, to persecute, in that case, uh, the Communist Party and the sympathizers. So uh, how come, so how come, how, how did they, how were they able to do this? So, uh, of course, the Indonesian government was one of the many governments in the world that were, uh, uh, that had, uh, the, they bought these uh, uh, machines supplied by the Swiss company Crypto AG. For 50 years, Crypto AG uh, supplied uh, uh, secretly, secretly sabotaged cipher machines and the American intelligence, the West German intelligence, and the UK intelligence were able to easily break the codes. We know this because about one year ago, there was uh, this story from uh, the Washington Post and some uh, German media that were able to, to get uh, the, a classified uh, uh, CIA history, an internal history of the whole operation and they had also the internal history of the operation from the B and the, and also they did also a lot of interviews. So in this way, they you know uh, reconstruct everything. 
and uh, this is regarded uh, uh, as the intelligence coup of the century. And uh, uh, everything starts from uh, Boris Agalin, who was the crypto founder. Uh, he fled uh, to the US during the Second World War and uh, sold uh, his mechanical cipher machines at the time to the army. Then uh, he went back to Switzerland, and, uh, but the US intelligence was worried because uh, he, was, he kept updating his machines. They were quite good. So he sent uh, a friend of him and uh, a well-known cryptographer, William Friedman, that is considered the uh, father of the cryptology in the US, to persuade Egelin to sell his most advanced machines only to US-approved countries. So, <clears throat> in intelligence terms, this is called a denial operation. So basically, you want to restrict uh, the technology. You, want, you don't want your adversaries being able to get uh, an hold on this technology. Uh, of course, crypto was also receiving some money for this and was, was also receiving some cash in order to push the marketing of the machine so that they could expand their market. So in, in the timeline you see at the bottom, uh, there is the timeline of the whole operation. Uh, the first, uh, it begins uh, around the middle 50s when there is this gentleman agreement between uh, Friedman and Hagelin. Then there is a turn uh, around uh, the middle of the 60s, as we will see, with an upgrade of the operation. Then actually the B and D and the CIA takes over, so basically they completely control uh, the managing of the, the company, then just the CIA. So, and uh, each phase has a different code name, like Spartan, Thesaurus, Rubicon, and so on. So, the, actually, the breakthrough moment for the American intelligence came uh, around middle, the middle of, you know, of the 60s, when uh, uh, there was a shift to electronic devices, because to adapt to the new technology, Crypto AG accepted uh, their help, accepted uh, the NSA help. And in, in the 67, they rolled out this new electronic model that you see in the picture, uh, whose uh, inner workings were designed by the NSA. So as the same uh, CIA report states, the foreign government at this point were paying uh, uh, money to the US and the, the German intelligence for having the most secret communications read by them and also by other governments because uh, this intelligence was then uh, shared at least with uh, probably with the Five Eyes Alliance. Uh, because yeah, as I said before, the first machines were mechanical, then there was the upgrade to the electronic ones and, um, and this was definitely uh, the moment when the operation changed and became uh, um, more active. So, <clears throat> of course, the NSA uh, didn't install a, a backdoor in a very uh, close, uh, strict uh, meaning. Uh, this is a quote from the Washington Post, so the language is not actually technical, but basically uh, they manipulated the, the algorithms so that the NSA could more easily uh, break the code uh, in a shorter time. Of course, they had still to intercept uh, the communication. And then the company made two versions of the, its products, the secure models for friendly governments and the allies, and the rigged systems for everyone else. Interesting detail, you see in the map the countries, Italy was one of the countries who was receiving the rigged systems. And together with uh, Spain, Greece, Turkey, so all close allies, actually, of the US and the West Germany. 
And this actually was a bond of contention between uh, the CIA and the B and uh, because the Germany, the German uh, were more worried about the consequences of uh, you know this with the Allies. Uh, there are also interesting story about the fact that uh, the BND was also very interested in the fact that they were making good money and they were paying cash the CIA in a garage like sort of movie scenario and the CIA was much more interested in the intelligence operation of course but uh, anyway in the 90s the B and the BND leaves and uh, so the CIA acquires I mean total control of the company and also starts buying other crypto companies other crypto firms Unfortunately, the documents uh, don't say which ones, so we don't have the details. We just know that it went on buying some of them and liquidating also some of the competitors. Um, in the meantime, it was the 90s and the 2000s, and the encryption market was changing, was moving from hardware to software, was, uh, there were a lot of products proliferating all over the world, as uh, <clears throat> this uh, survey uh, shows. And uh, so times changed, and uh, at the end there were also a lot of rumors about crypto AG at this point, actually. And uh, so the CIA sold uh, the company. So if we analyze the whole operation, we see the, we had the denial operation, trying to limit the spread of the technology. Then we have the active measures, because it becomes really a spying operation where you uh, covertly rig a system and uh, spy on, uh, in this case, on the customers. And then you try the takeover of the competition that could jeopardize uh, your, your operation and uh, the exit. So you basically get out, and uh, of course uh, the, we have uh, a technological shift that mm, you know gives you the opportunity to to go from the denial operation to the active measures, and then you have another technological shift that makes the operation not worthwhile anymore. And these are the two moments, defining moments of the whole process. <laughs> Talking about. Uh, going from the uh, hardware to the software market in security, we, we can talk about another security product, another encryption product, a software in this case. Uh, for talking about this, we, we have to start from uh, uh, Paul Calder Leroux. I don't know if you know him, I, how many of you know Leroux? Could you just raise your hand if you know Leroux? Not so many, few. Okay, so Paul Calder Leroux, I mean, it's a strange figure, uh, is a former criminal uh, cartel boss, really a kingpin, a drugs and weapons trafficker. He has been arrested and then sentenced to 25 years. He was involved in everything, money laundering, drug and arms trafficking, organized crime, everything. He even admitted to have arranged some murders. But before his criminal career, and maybe also during, we don't know exactly, definitely before, we know for sure, uh, he was a very talented programmer. And uh, the funny story, someone even thinks that Leroux could be Satoshi Nakamoto, Soloshi Calder Leroux, actually. And of course, we know that there was a time when uh, each month you would have an article pinpointing uh, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto candidate. So there are many. He is one of the many. There are some stories and some hints about this. You can find the articles and make your own mind about uh, these arguments. Just, but this is not the main point here. The main point is that there is a connection between Leroux and TrueCrypt, which is a well-known software. Because we know that Leroux is responsible for creating this open source uh, disk encryption platform called E4M. 
encryption for the masses. He started building uh, it in the 1997. Uh, of course, it, uh, the, it was a software that let you encrypt the hard drives or conceal the existence of encrypted files. And uh, he said that he, he wrote it from scratch and uh, he released it for free and he made the code available for others. He even wrote a sort of a, a privacy manifesto at the time. Of course, we are at the end of the 90s, so it's really the time of the cypherpunks. And in this privacy manifesto, it talks about, you know, the battle for privacy because we are losing this privacy in the real world and so and so. It even talks about, I know there is a need for investigation for the criminality, but we also need the privacy. It's interesting <laughs> to look at it with the insight. Uh, so, uh, Leroux went on to work for a security company, SecureStar, that later accused him of having incorporated some of this work into E4M. And later, there was a group of anonymous developers that, who released a new file encryption program called TrueCrypt that was built on E4M. So there was a controversy with the Secure Star because of this. So there was a first release, then there were a few changes, another release, uh, but the end, the anonymous programmers went on with TrueCrypt, maintained it. We still don't know who they are, we still don't know how they funded it. Of course, here in this uh, uh, text, you can see that the, the reference to E4M, to Leroux, and, uh, and so on. Uh, interesting, the Secure Star colleagues suspected that Leroux was part of the TrueCrypt team, but they couldn't prove it. And uh, also Matthew Green, who is a well-known uh, cryptologist and computer science professor, said that, uh, yeah, the origin of TrueCrypt has always been very mysterious. And we don't know if it was Leroux who wrote it or others, we just can't say. But we have to say that later on, Leroux uh, denied, denied this. Anyway, then it was 2013, and we had the NSA gate, remember Snowden revelations, uh, the surveillance programs by the NSA, and of course also the efforts by some intelligence agency to, uh, col to you know, spy, to collect uh, traffic, but also to um, weaken uh, security products or uh, encryption. So, some speculation arose about the presence of a backdoor in TrueCrypt and the fact that there was some mystery about TrueCrypt, of course, didn't help. So a crowdfunding campaign was launched in order to audit it. And uh, uh, there was Matthew Green, again, uh, um, trying to, to uh, lead uh, on this project. Because as he said, I would feel better if I knew who the TrueCrypt authors were. I mean, it's not a crime to be anonymous, he said, but uh, since TrueCrypt is used by many people for many important reasons, we would like to have a look at the code. And also there were some uh, researchers that had doubts about the binaries, and uh, yeah, because the project didn't provide uh, deterministic builds, so you can, yeah, you know, and uh, so, there was a researcher who actually compiled it and answered no, it's, it's fine, but there, is a, there was a lot of debate and uh, articles about this. In the meantime, the audit, the process of the audit, the crowdfunding, the audit went on, but then we had a plot twist because uh, abruptly the TrueCrypt project uh, was shut down in 2013, in the middle of the audit. And this didn't help with the speculation, of course. I think Matthew Green was really upset at the time 
and uh, he, he said, you know, they, they, they set the whole thing on fire. Uh, maybe now, uh, after what they have done today, makes it impossible to go on to, with this audit. Uh, uh, of course, you know, doing this now will make people think that there is some big uh, evil vulnerability in the code. And so uh, there was some uh, pessimism <laughs> at the moment, at the time, and um, also because, yeah, it was closed and uh, declared unsecure, and, you know, it was uh, unexpected. Uh, but the audit went on, and at the end, the result was that uh, TrueCrypt was a well-designed piece of software, of crypto software, with no evidence of deliberate backdoors or any severe design flaw. This is the final result of the audit. The website that, was, uh, that had been created, is TrueCrypt audited yet, could finally answer yes. Uh, Matthew Green even wrote that TrueCrypt was really unique a unique piece of software, and it was really a pity that had been discontinued, and it was hopeful that someone else would go on. <clears throat> so, to summarize the, the story with the words of Matthew Green, uh, Leroux wrote the precursor, the precursor to TrueCrypt, then he became a kingpin. <laughs> TrueCrypt was a fork of E4M by, made by anonymous authors. There were some problems, new released. The authors went on, they had funding. We, there is no evidence Leroux uh, was involved in this, uh, even if he was using TrueCrypt. And of course, of course, the audit was not about the authorship, it was just about the software security. And then you know that today we have some forks. We have like VeraCrypt, which is a fork, and so on. So, final story, it's about VPNs. Uh, VPNs are a very controversial topic, and it's very difficult because every time there are a lot of demands and a lot of requests by users uh, about VPNs, and it's very difficult to give any recommendation about this. And uh, you know that the ancient Greeks we would say, know yourself, but <laughs> we, we should also add that you should know in a very intimate way also your VPN provider if you want really to use a VPN. So the, uh, just a few weeks ago, there was this story about the VPN consolidation process. So basically we had uh, this former company called Crossrider that had a shady, bad reputation because third parties were using its platform for ads and malware distribution. And the company then changed name, became Cape Technologies. And in the meantime, they start acquiring VPNs. So actually, CyberGhost, ZenMate, private internet access. In the last weeks, then they bought one of the major VPN providers, which is ExpressVPN. And also, they bought a collection of VPN review websites, you know, the websites that give you a ranking of the best VPNs, kind of a conflict of interest, I would say. The same days they were doing this and acquiring uh, um, ExpressVPN, it came out that their, the ExpressVPN CIO was involved in Project Raven, which for the ones you, uh, of you you don't know, is a mercenary, uh, was a mercenary cyber spy unit of the Emirates that has been accused of spying on journalists and activists and so on. And he, the CIO, he actually had the, legal problems in the US for this. He had to pay a big penalty and also, you know, he had to co cooperate with the FBI about this. 
and this didn't help and in terms of reaction by the users the two news together uh, if you look at the reaction of the user were really not happy about all the whole story and the whole acquisition and uh, but there was also an interesting analysis about this made by uh, a security researcher called uh, Juan Andre Guerrero Sad who highlighted how the combination of a malicious ad network and a VPN provider is uh, especially dangerous because uh, you can profile specific user and also you can manipulate their traffic and this opens you know, the way for tactical network injection. So basically you can trojanize, trojanize someone on, you know, on the fly. And, uh, and also people are actually paying you to run this. You make money, you make ad revenue, you sell their data, and occasionally you may infect some specific special customers on demand of someone else. So you can actually, yeah, this thing of paying and making money out of this, it reminds me of the other story also. But anyway, so there was a, a worry about uh, the possibilities for targeted espionage coming from this type of uh, uh, consolidation. So uh, going on uh, to the conclusions, I would say, uh, when does the backdoor dreaming come true? Because, yeah, when it's a dream, when it's paranoia, when it's real. So, which are the enabling factors that make backdoors more likely? That, and maybe one is a technological shift. If you have a technological change, a shift in the technology, you, have, you may have an opportunity to insert yourself. And also, if there is an ideological drive, like uh, during the Cold War, or maybe the war against terrorism, or things like this, then if there, you have a market concentration, a market dominance, because it makes uh, the effort of trying to, to get a backdoor worthwhile if you dominate the market. And also, if there is a strong market demand, uh, because you don't want to, to do something completely out of touch with what's going on, and if there is a strong market demand, everything you know, works better, and you, you may even make money out of this operation. And if other strategies to contain the spread of the, of the technology you don't want others to use, uh, others to use uh, fail. So other containment strategies fail, so it remains uh, manipulating or introducing sort of backdoors, let's say. Or maybe other things, or probably other things that I didn't put, I didn't think of, I'm sure some of you have better ideas and suggestions on this, and if you have, I would love to hear them. And also, this is really something I would like to ask here. So what do you need to trust a security product? Because this is a question, again, that is uh, very, is recurring in the last uh, years. And is it enough or, you know, okay to have an open source code, to have audits made by whom? if there is a transparent history of the whole project, if you know the developers and they are not maybe anonymous, or if there is a wide community around it, if you know where the money comes from, or maybe you need also a market which is diversified where you have competitors and it's not just a monopolist, or maybe you want an ideological affinity to the project. And uh, yeah, and so I leave you with, the, with these questions <laughs> and thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you for the talk. 
Okay, um, I'm wondering what your uh, talked about the shift in paradigm between uh, about uh, the 17 uh, when the NSA basically produced crypto uh, as black boxes. For example, I'm thinking about DES or ECC DRBG and so on. And nowadays where uh, crypto algorithms are the outcome of open challenges uh, on the community, do you think this is sufficient to prevent backdoors on algorithm or is just one step in uh, uh, this direction, the, the last algorithms, for, for example, AES or the pot quantum algorithms are based on challenges. So what do you think about it? I think that uh, like the, there is uh, the paper I, sh I just mentioned it. Sorry, I was trying to go up. Yeah, this paper uh, was actually, it, it's from the 2016, uh, so it's a little bit old, 16, but uh, it's still good because it shows you how uh, the market changed in a few years and uh, it actually became much more global, with uh, much more diversified and uh, with a lot of, uh, with a lot of actors from different countries, different different actors, you have also no-profit groups, we have uh, companies, we have, you know, so, uh, and I think the idea uh, of the authors is that this helps against, uh, you know, uh, uh, this type of risk, of course, because uh, it's not just one country controlling uh, a, a specific technology or a specific uh, product, and, uh, but of course we know that there have been a lot of talks about different type of backdoors in the last years. So uh, if a couple of years ago there was this statement by um, some of the major governments, it was like almost more or less the five al alliance, so US, UK, Australia, but probably also Japan in this case, and they were like asking for uh, a way to read uh, in, encrypted communication. So, so, of course, for them, uh, the concern is the spread of end-to-end -end encryption to major platforms like Facebook, for instance. Or, so, of course, there is this debate now. But in terms of uh, having a diversified offer uh, that prevents you, uh, especially if you know what you are talking about, you know, yeah, I think we are better positioned now. I would like to ask, uh, what do you think about um, United Kingdom now uh, relying on uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, to um, protect their secret data about intelligence? And um, if you think that there will be some kind of problems about security and uh, I don't know if you think it's secure or not, to, to rely on a company like Amazon to such important things? Of course, there is a strong connection between some of these companies and some governments because uh, we have seen it after, uh, we, have, we have seen it with the Snowden revelation in the US, of course, that was this strong connection. And even if some of these companies actually, after that, trying to distance themselves, uh, we still have a lot of close connection between uh, military, uh, for instance, and these tech companies. Uh, Amazon, of course, uh, is one of them, but we had also other companies. So I guess it really depends, uh, um, and these are American companies. So uh, I think the problem is if you are not the American government, or maybe the UK government that has a special relation with the U uh, US, but if I was a European government, I think this, I mean, I would see it as a problem. Uh, during the first quarter of the, of this year, of, the, of 2021, I think, so yeah, this year, uh, the Europe released a document uh, saying that Europe basically wanted the, some backdoors or something like that in 
cryptographic algorithms in a way to uh, protect not only the privacy of people but also the security, the, the actual security of uh, of the, the security of people as in like physical security in case of uh, terroristic attempts. So what do you think about yeah, Europe asking to put back, back doors in cryptographic algorithms? Do you think it fair or? I feel that Europe doesn't have a clear position on that. I think uh, because we had actually different uh, positions and some of them were really more endorsing a strong encryption for security. So, but there are, uh, especially uh, the position of some governments, uh, uh, they would like a more uh, proactive uh, um, attitude on this for national security reasons, at least what they say. So there are, uh, at the moment, I would see there are some conflicting uh, positions in Europe about this. And uh, we also, because we have a very complex government uh, governance architecture in Europe, which doesn't make easy to understand exactly what is the position of Europe on this. But it's, not, it's definitely something that needs to be monitored because it could uh, introduce uh, things that could uh, uh, weaken the, um, the idea of uh, encryption and security, at least from a, a cybersecurity standpoint. Okay, thank you. Actually, I have one question. And <laughs> it, is, it is more about ethics because uh, uh, like in the last two years, two big papers came out in cryptography. One of them is called, uh, really, how to backdoor a cipher. And uh, it is uh, an example on how you can create uh, a backdoor cipher that uh, basically cannot be detected. Um, how ethic is to publish something like this in your opinion? I mean, if I, as a researcher, uh, give away to backdoor a cipher for a product to some malicious uh, company, is, is this right, or I sh shouldn't I publish something like this? Uh, this is a, a difficult question. I, I would say that as long as you are doing a research, uh, you should be free to do any kind of research on these topics, really. Because also because you never know. I mean, if you are not doing that, someone else is doing it anyway, and you don't know how you're going to apply. So it's still better to do research on this. The issue is later, it's not when you do the research. It, the issue is when you let uh, the market use this type of technologies in, um, in, in a completely unregulated way. And uh, as we have seen with some surveillance technologies in the last years, so I think it's more a political issue than a science research issue. Thank you. So, okay, okay. <laughs>